I'm getting punchy. <laughs> the cop who's married the hooker. My Linda. God, I can't believe I remember that. No, it was Jack. You know that character actor? He played Manny. Yeah. And uh, and Shelley Winters was his wife. Red Buttons. Red Buttons was the last singer who was looking after the girl, Bond. Yeah. And then the um, party was out. And then he was the Yeah. Yeah. He had <laughs> Sorry, we're way back now. And we are going way, way back. <laughs> that is definitely the corner of the, uh, the elevator. Do you think the wheel could have been made in the elevator? Yeah, I hate to tell you, Jim, Shelly Winters didn't make it. Neither did Linda. No, I didn't make it. No, oh my God, we actually didn't broadcast them on. <laughs> okay. So we really we clearly can't curve there now in that flight deck where this elevator was. You think we could drop down here? Take a look. Over, uh, over look here or over here? On the right. I think we're so little right. I think we're right over it. We're looking straight down right now. We're still on, on top of it. Okay. Below this level, below this level, there would be uh, potentially. Uh, guns. It would be. A, it would potentially be seen. What do you think? You want to pull to the right, like five or ten meters? Yeah, I think so. What do you think? It looks pretty. If I turn 45, it looks like going ahead along the side looks pretty clear. No more big obstruct obstructions. Uh, we do a 10 meter move, just kind of the lateral away from the wreck. Yeah. Maybe five. I don't know. Maybe a small. Just five. A, just a small little bump. Okay. Because it seems like we're still kind of moving from the last move a little bit over. Yeah. The 6-5 six, six, move. So. Hey, uh, yeah, John's telling us that um, right at the, the deck edge across from the elevator, there should have been double uh, A guns there, and, and we don't see that at all. I think it's uh, that part's completely ripped away. Yeah, no, we were looking at the plans and thinking that, you know, there were three small tubs there. Yeah. But you're not seeing them. We saw them on the other side. We saw them on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, he's also noting that um, 
we're not seeing any of the wooden planking here. There were like little fragments of it on the other side, I think. But yeah, most of the flight deck is is either missing or, or moved. It's interesting to see the um, that we can see it next to the elevator shaft, though. I think it's dis it's disjointed, though. I think it's come up and like shifted over, but it seems to be hanging off the edge of the wreck. So as we keep as we keep moving, wow. Yeah, we, um, we the next sort of major area we'd be coming into would be the area where the island superstructure would be. Yeah, yep. Yeah, actually, not yeah, not very far from this. The end of this elevator shaft should be the the tower. So I guess that's the question is, do you want to try to go backwards at this point or keep moving towards the island or just, I mean, this move is still playing out. Um, well, we're, I mean, we're not, we're still moving forward. We're, we're just moving off so that we can get a little closer and not be like looking down the whole time. I think it's fine. Okay. Because we want to, we want to approach the island from a distance, not like smack into it anyway. That, that's actually a, a really good uh, angle and, and distance, I think. If we can come a little lower for lighting. So I haven't called in any additional space off the wreck uh, okay. pilot. So do you want to go with this for now or push off a little bit? We can go with this for now, see how, see how it does. Yeah, so if you just want to move um, laterally like close, thir 30 meters and see where that takes us. So like that uh, 45 degree. Okay. Forty-five degrees. Right. Yeah, let me see how much we moved so far. good we're almost done I think we're almost done the movement we put in earlier okay cool so if you're happy with that um, angle keep going with that and, uh, thinking about 50 degrees because the ship is widening out a bit yeah do a 20 meter move if we're close to the sure yeah island. that works Bridge nav. Like to do a ship move two zero meters at bearing five five. Thank you. You can really see a lot of the rusticles here on the outside of the wreck. You see the tub? Mike, do you see the tub? There we go. Yeah. Yep, yeah, there's a gun tub. And yeah, John concurs there should be, the island should be about 30 meters away from where we are. Yeah. <laughs> it's P4. So we're like, 
moving, or like somewhere in here. Yeah, I think that's one of the these gun tubs, maybe, right here. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, okay. I think that's right. It does seem like there's a sonar target 30 meters. Yeah, that's the yeah. that's the island. That's the island. Yep. And we saw that from the other side of the wreck too. We were, when we could scan a, a above the wreckage, it was nice and bright when we came down on the Kaga wreck, which I think will be on the next day or two. Um, the um, the tower is like completely gone. Looks like there's a sonar target about 10 meters to my right. 90, 90 degrees from the direction I'm looking right now. Uh, yeah, that could just be um, like a, a piece of wreckage up on the on the flight deck. It could, oh, that could be, um, there's like a, I don't know what it was, but there's like an anvil looking thing on the deck that, that could be the, like the first part of the island that we're seeing the sonar that we'll get to first, if it's okay. still, if it's still there. Hi everyone, I'm back from dinner. Can y'all hear me okay? Yep, we can yeah? hear you. Okay. Yep. Are we looking at the island right now, or you said we're approaching it? No, it's about uh, 20 meters away, I okay. think. So we are approaching. And is this just part of the flight deck? Yeah, it's a flight deck above it and a, a gun tub uh, for anti-aircraft guns at the bottom. That, that's that rounded structure there. So, uh, John, who's who's viewing, what is that? You just sent us a, a schematic with a purple arrow pointing at this gun tub. It goes through a, uh, yeah, I, that's exactly what I was about to ask you, what I call the anvil thing. He, he, he just answered me as I started asking the question. Um, he says it's the director for the casemate guns. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, they're they're on the plans and on these 3D schematics I have, but I don't I didn't know what it was. Thank you. I prefer anvil thing. Gotcha, this actually isn't a gun tub, it's uh it's for a director or lookout. Interesting.
Yeah, John's saying it's probably gone because we don't see it on the deck. Which is not a surprise. Wow, look at the, the side plating is all completely gone there. Wow. Jim, do you see that? It's like the, the hull is completely gone there. Guys, just note that we're probably very close to the, the bridge uh, tower. Mike, I have a question for you. Um, just viewing the, the, the vesicles, I think you called them, do you notice a difference between the Japanese um, the Akagi and the Yorktown yesterday in regards to corrosion? Sorry, Malia, can you give me one sec? Oh, yeah. That purple thing. Are you guys seeing what's up on the deck level? Mike? When she bounces up, a slight deck level. You see that on the deck? Sorry, Jim, can you repeat that? I was uh, chatting with someone else. Look, at, look what's up on the flight deck, Mike. Is that the island we're looking at? Or what's left of it? No, that, that that's a that's a spot just in front of the bridge, um, like a, a small lookout or director there. No, behind that. We, I believe, we're at the very forward part of the uh, island. Yeah. Got about five meters left in that last twenty meter move. Okay. Um, do you can you pan up and to the right a little bit? I just want to see how close we are to the uh, um, if we can see what what remains of the tower there. Some altitude. It may, it may be that we can't. Quite, it may be that we can't quite see it yet. Um, we can just stay as is um, and, and wait for the next move. But just just be aware that the tower is coming up, and there could be some uh, wires hanging off it in places. So, Mike, this, if you know, with this surviving lower level of the island, this is a logical target for some photogrammetry? Um, 
Th this is just the very, very forward part. Let's see what remains of the rest of it. Um, and that might be something we, we attempt uh, later on. The um, John saying the circular tub down there is the um, the Type 89 director. Oh no, that's that's above that. That's that's the gun tub below. Oh no, I was right. Yeah, I said that. Right. It's the circular tub is the Type 89 gun director. We're now about 10 meters off the port side. Yeah, this is a good position. Roger. Yeah, we're seeing more of the uh, of the bridge tower uh, coming in um, above the deck there. But I'm not I'm not entirely sure um, I'm not entirely sure how much of it's still there. Okay. Yeah, and I think at this point we've pretty much played out that last move so um, just let me know if you want to make another one yeah I do I want to um, basically lateral along this deck edge here I think we're at the very first structure that's like low on the on the bridge you can see it um, on the uh, on the plan that I gave you it's like there was a, a little a, a tower there that's gone and then there's like a little step before the yeah, bridge I see that's what, you're what we're looking at yep. um, so we need to if we start moving uh, to the right, like stay this distance from the wreck, but move to the right. So like, I don't know, 45, 50 degrees. Um, we're going to start to see the bridge and we can go up and down to take a look at, at what remains there. Okay. Uh, what are you thinking? Like to 20 meters? Yeah, that should be a good start. So Mike, as you guys can see, there's more elevation to this thing as we're moving. Yep. Well, that's strange. I'm not seeing anything on sonar. Yeah, there's not. There's nothing higher than this. Really. There's no island there. No. That's this is this is the highest highest point in this area. Bizarre. So it's just gone. That's not enough. I don't even know what that is. Oh, there's a top is sheared off, but we are definitely looking at the island and yeah, there's the a there, there's an anti-aircraft gun. Yep, and it's exactly where it should be. So there's far more of this that has survived. Is that anti-aircraft gun directly below the center of the island? I'm uh I'm trying to find a better shot of the island here in this book. Yeah, it was just past it. Or no. Looks like it's just past it. it yeah, I think it was it. just it was just so that just whatever asked. we were looking at was part of the tower, but it's gone. The rest of it's gone. That's amazing. That's I'm very surprised by that. Like this anti-aircraft gun was just 
half yeah. of the of part of the island. So yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Yep. Uh, I wonder said, if there'd be any. Go ahead. I was just wondering if there would be any trace of the uh, the base of the mast where the um, you know the national ensign and and other signal halyards would have flown. Uh, it does not appear to be. Would have been just just aft of the uh, island structure on the deck. Yeah, we're already past that. So the the, the anti-aircraft gun that was aft of this uh, island is uh, is below us right now. So we're pretty much stand staring at that uh, aft part of the bridge. So I don't see any structure there or mount for it. All right, guys, that, I mean, that's, uh, that is what it is. So there's no island to, to take a close look at. Um, if we can get a little lower down to about where that aircraft get, uh, anti-aircraft gun is, then we'll just continue moving um, along this edge of the deck. Oh, do that. Uh, so I haven't moved. I was just waiting to yeah, see no worries. Yeah. we're scoping out here. Mike, yeah. Mike, just hold for a second. Because we're actually getting, we're in an area where close to where what Russ was asking for is. All right, everyone, uh, let's um, let's just stand by for a sec. Yep, yep. understood. So, Mike, just confirming that the whole island is gone. That's that's all we have remaining. Well, th there's this little. Um, stump left of th this was part of the island but we you know it was probably the the lower structure and some internal part of it that's the rest of it was shorn or blown off wow do you guys see the aerial radar loop i'm sorry what's that radar this is not a radar Oh, it's not radar, sorry. It's a radio aerial. Radio aerial, sorry. Long night. The radio, the radio aerial is right there. What's that? I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you guys are asking for. We're asking you to hold here for a second, please. Okay, can we hold here? Yeah, we're, we're not moving right now, Jim. It's collapsed, but what we're looking at is the top of this structure. There's a loop there, Mike, and that was a radio aerial. The, you look down into there, it's fallen. There is something there called a radial aerial? Yes, you see that loop looks like a wheel it's up at the top? Yeah. That shows in the plan. Okay. Um, what that says is that the, that level above, Mike, just simply has to take and fallen in. And you can actually see how the whole curves a little bit there, potentially from, you know, corrosion fire. But if you see how that's bent in, that, the structure on top has simply fallen in. Yeah. I think this. Um, do you see this sort of uh, hexagonal thing on the on the left? I think that might be the front of the bridge yeah. with the windows yeah. on it. Yeah. The lower part of the bridge. I can see it in the plans. Yeah. Right below. Well, this those. is good. This is. Yeah. This is what we were hoping for. Yeah. Because this is. It's far more survival of this than we would have thought, even though it's partially collapsed.
So this is where Admiral Nagumo and his staff would have been when they were forced to uh, evacuate by the, um, by the fires that were raging there. It's emotional to think about that. So, you know, again, what we've been talking about here is that this is seen some pretty incredible drama. This is where, as we've said, you know, this is where the Admiral and his staff had to evacuate by climbing down. Uh, the survival of this structure, even in its damaged state, is something we hadn't been expecting. It's rather amazing to see. And even though, you know, it has deteriorated and fallen in, there's still identifiable elements that clearly connect us back to that time and that point in the battle. Yeah, I think I think before we were um, a little high on it, so it didn't look as prominent as it should have. But I, yeah, this is like it seems like the top half of the of the tower is missing, but but this is the full um, footprint of it, I think. It was much smaller than Yorktown's because it didn't have the stack as part of it. And to see some yeah, of that, that's it, exactly. Some of that twisting in the collapse. The turn of events in this battle happened so quickly. You can just uh, really was not particularly long from the time the American attacks to these massive fires breaking out on this vessel. Archaeology team, can you remind us how long they fought the fires before uh, the bridge team moved the flag to another vessel and abandoned? Um, give me a sec. Thank you to all of our collaborators on shore, confirming that the bridge was only, was a very tiny footprint. So some of us surprised here by, by the look, but appreciate our archivist with so much knowledge about this ship contributing the main command portion of the island was only 12 feet by 15 feet, so a very small island and very different from, as we mentioned, Yorktown, where there was a, a smokestack right there, very near to the island, so we were looking at a much larger structure. Different designs, you know, both incredibly accomplished ships at waging war the way they did before they ended up here resting in Papahanaumokuakea. So Megan, to, to uh, respond to that question, uh, around 10.20 uh, a.m. on the 4th, uh, Akagi was bombed, and then on 04.50 on June 5th, uh, uh, it was ordered scuttled, so uh, about 18, 19 hours. I saw their hangar. Yeah. Oh, there's another elevator shaft. Elevator shaft, yeah. yeah. It's the one just after the island. I have to take this moment as well to say that there was also um, three hours earlier, there was a very dramatic moment when the uh, Army uh, B-26 bombers had attacked and one of them uh, on fire and uh, perhaps out of control, perhaps the, the pilot deliberately uh, choosing to do this, knowing that, that um, his time was nearly up, uh, passed no further away from this island, maybe even closer than we are right now, and nearly, nearly took out uh, Admiral Legumo's entire staff before uh, crashing into the sea. Did you see the stub uh, for the mast there? I, I spotted him as we went past. I'm sorry, what was that? What Russ was asking about was 
the mountains. Yeah, no, I hadn't, hadn't, uh, <laughs> I was, I was waxing eloquently about, uh, about the, uh, the C-26 Marauder attack, but, um, but yeah, I'm sure, uh, that's, that's good, good to hear. I mean, the, um, what I was asking about earlier had the, the mounting, uh, points for the, um, for the, uh, the flagstaff or, you know, it looks like a kind of tripod, um, uh, uh, signal halyard where the, um, the Japanese, uh, naval ensign would have, would have flown and, and also the other, uh, the other signal signals, um, you know, to the, uh, for the rest of the task force. And there was there were two protrusions coming out of the that I think may be part of that. That we saw as we dropped down to the, the gun. Yeah, there's some really iconic photographs, especially you know geared around the um, the Pearl Harbor attack of that that island and and the um, you know the rising sun uh, flag uh, flying from from exactly that spot. That's just amazing. I just am thinking back to decades ago when I first dived on the Arizona, and these images of this carrier launching those aircraft. Uh, certainly, you know, they've, in history books and the rest, and a number of us, you know, thought at the time actually was, you know, imagine the day comes when we can reach the depths where the carriers are at midway. To go from the deck of the Arizona to the deck of the Akagi was something none of us thought was possible. And while it's virtual, I, it, I've sort of lost for words because in my own lifetime and career, uh, I've, I've seen both decks. One I've swum over and touched, and now the ROV is doing this live. It, span of history and many miles but linked powerfully you know, by, by those stories and by the survival of both of those ships. I remember watching the movie Midway from the 1970s so many times as a, as a young teenager. Thinking, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would ever be part of uh, the team that discovered the Akagi and the, and the Cog. And to be able this evening to, to see this site is just incredible for me. Unbelievable. So I, I think we are probably ready to continue uh, moving uh, along the flight deck. Is that is that good with you guys? It's good with me. Yeah. Ready, yeah. Um, John's also asking um, as we do that to take a look to see if the center elevator, which I believe we did see quickly, uh, is still there, and if it's um more than you know if the hole around it is greater than it or if the square is still there yeah. uh, depending how much damage so we'll take a look as we go okay sounds good um so we're done going as low as we want to go here too as well yeah we can um we can yeah we can get back to that position we were in where we were like illuminating the uh the edge of the deck and going parallel to it okay so it seems like we want to move along that deck edge again a bearing of five zero makes sense. Yeah. Um, how large a move are we looking to do here? Um, there shouldn't be, well, I speak now, but there should not be anything very scary, like obstruction wise, because the, the, the tower was kind of it. So um, I think we can go do probably a 30 meter move. Roger that. At the 50 degrees, sounds good. It'll do. Mike, did you guys, when we were looking past the island, did you? See what we saw, which was the open uh, pit to the central elevator. Yeah, but we're going to go back and look at it more carefully. Uh, John was asking. Okay, understood. Are you trying to lateral over there to see that, or? I think it was right here. I saw it right. Yeah, it's just above that. There, there it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, we're not going to go over there yet. We're going to, after we do this um, uh, survey down to the stern and up a little bit, we're going to then do a, a pass over the uh, over the whole flight deck, and we'll get a better look at, at these Roger. features. 
bridge nav. I'd like to do a ship move three zero meters bearing five zero. Thank you. Thank you, John, for adding some more to that timeline uh, as we think about the events that happened here. Aboard Akagi, the, the bombs fell at 10.26 a.m. and Admiral, Admiral Nagumo abandoned the island at 10.45. So uh, less, than, less than 20 minutes, um, how quickly things, things changed and turned and, you know, just can imagine the team here. It's solemn imagining what those those minutes were like. You know, and how very special to be able to bring this and, and share it and um, ensure that folks all around the world can understand and remember the history that happened here eight decades ago. And add that layer to the many, many histories and ancestors uh, here in Papahanaumokuakea. Mike, can you remind us um, of the of these three large uh, gun tubs on the port side? Um, is this is this the first as we're moving our way down, or have we passed one already? Uh, I don't I don't think this is one of the those larger ones. I think those oh, are going to okay. be further uh, aft. Um, one should be coming up, but yeah, this was. Um, this is, I think, a smaller anti-aircraft gun relative to some of the other ones. Looks absolutely massive hanging off the side of the ship. Yeah. Unbelievable, this is one of the smaller ones. It's all relative. Yeah. Let me see if I can find a better picture of that. I, I have a plan that's this, the other side, the starboard side. Oh yeah, that is it. But it, they're different on the uh, on the. They look different on the, the the tubs themselves are different on the starboard side, or maybe it's just the drawing. <clears throat> We've come about 15 meters off the port side. What's that? We've come about, we're about 15 meters off the port side now. Is this a good distance or would you like to be closer? No, we should be closer, please. Okay. We go ahead and move, move five. Maybe, let's see. What do we say? Zero four five is running astern? Yeah, five zero. So. Somewhere between four five and five zero. So if we were to do a zero, Three zero will bring us close closer uh, for the next move. If we want to go closer, we should go like a three ten. Oh, you just want to step over? Okay. Yeah, I mean we're already moving this way, but if we want to step closer, we should do a separate move this okay. way. Yeah, that'd be good because then we'll miss less of the wreck. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna put. Uh, Five meters at three one zero. Yep, sounds good. Mike, can you or any of our archaeology team would like to share? Can you clarify um, these these armaments? They're named for the size of the projectiles that they shoot. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So there's like, and they kind of have a they kind of use metric and imperial 
uh, as well. So there's like, the, these were um, 120 millimeter, um, but for example, battleships fired 16 inch shells. We, and the ones that we saw on Yorktown at the stern yesterday were five inch shells. Okay, thank you. Yeah, 120 millimeters is almost a five inch, a five inch shell. Yeah, and so, so this is- Incredible this violence. Is, this is the forward most of, uh, there will be two more 120 millimeter mounts as we go uh, towards the stern. So Mike, earlier I was asking about um, the level of corrosion um, when you compare the Yorktown with the Akagi. Um, have you noticed a difference? And what, what would be the kind of the factors that would play into that? I mean, Bridge, that nav. They're similar in that they, um, th there is quite a bit of metal preserved. There's rusticles. Um, I'd like to move five meters at three one zero. But what I think is different is, um, you know, th Thank there's you. a level of burning on this wreck that is not apparent on Yorktown, except uh, at the the bridge structure at Yorktown, which had caught on fire. Um, so I think we're going to see. Uh, it's not necessarily accelerated corrosion, but it's a different. It's different um, chemical reaction in the metal. Uh, due to the fires. Uh, plus, I think this one is broken more, so there's going to be accelerated corrosion uh, along those all, all those fractures. Okay, thank you. Can I look at... We're approaching the ninth hour of exploration here from the time we launched the dive. Uh, so here in Hawaii, <laughs> time zone, uh, in Papahanaumokuakea, it is uh, coming up on 7 p.m. Well, we want to give all of our appreciation and thanks to the team who are um, all around the world contributing to us in this dive right now. Our, our team in the Exploration Command Center in Silver Spring, Maryland, at NOAA headquarters, are well into the wee hours of the morning. 
Uh, we so appreciate their assistance and expertise. And I acknowledge and thank June Kimura in Japan, where uh, we started very early in the morning for June, and it's now um, just after lunch, 1.45 p.m. So uh, our team stretches around the world, and we know that our, our viewers and everyone enjoying this dive and learning with us as well. Um, we appreciate whatever time okay. of the day or night it is. Thanks for being here with us. Please send in your questions, and if you're watching over on YouTube, please feel free to come over to nautiluslive.org where you can learn a lot more about the team um, who are here in the room, learn about the voices you're hearing. Everyone has a Explorer bio on the website, um, including our team ashore. Uh, you can also check out the latest social media posts, um, some uh, blog about the story of the Battle of Midway to set the context for the place and time we are exploring here. Uh, and lots lots more material to check out. So come over there, send us a comment, send us a question. We'd love um, to get your thoughts and reactions here in as well. We already know that we're sharing sharing this time and space with um, people whose families have, were part of this event, who you know grew up learning the stories of this place, um, who studied this in their own careers and, and academics. Um, and just made people that move. fascinated yeah. to learn. So I think we might want to do another one. I think we need another one. We're about 20 meters off now. All right. Falling off. Bridge nap. Uh, I'd like to do a ship move five meters at bearing three one zero. Thank you. Question about um, is Akagi the last major uh, Japanese worship to be mapped um, in this area? Not uh, not even from this engagement in the Battle of Midway, where four Japanese aircraft carriers sunk seven ships overall in the battle: um, the Akagi, the Kaga, the Soryu, and the Hyuyu. Uh, the Kaga was mapped. Um, and had an exploratory dive, one dive done by the team on the Petrol and Vulcan Inc. in 2019. Um, it was located uh, near the location we are now. And that team in that same expedition also um, was led in by great work by the Nautios team from the, uh, 1999 in this area that developed some mapping data uh, that helped lead to Kaga. The Vulcan team also um, was able to sonar map and image Akagi, but not have the chance to visually inspect the site. So this is a very special first time uh, eyes have been on Akagi in 81 years. But the Soryu and the Hiryu remain, um, their locations remain unknown still at this time. As well as the, uh, the light cruiser Makuma was also, um, was also sunk during this battle, which Absolutely. is somewhere out there. And, and the destroyer, the Hamen. Yeah, the U.S. destroyer Hamen uh, sank near Yorktown, but um, due to our um, our, sl our sl slow movements um, with with just getting r surveying around the wreck, we weren't able to uh, to to go scout out for it because it's probably a couple kilometers away. So it would have taken a very long time to uh, to maneuver out there um, if we had picked a direction correctly. So that, that was not something we were able to do. Picking up some background noise. Yeah. Um, on the audio. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just want to let folks know, just stopped. as a general update on where we're at here, moving from bow to stern. We're about almost, or uh, probably about halfway uh, on that journey. So we're uh, gradually getting there and moving aft. Can uh, can can everyone watch uh, uh, who are able to call into SPL from shore? Could you guys mute your mics uh, if you're not uh, engaging, please? That would be great. Thank you.
Yeah, we're just uh, waiting for the ship to move us a little closer to the wreck so we can uh, continue exploring. I know it. Uh, I know it. Uh, you're probably a little impatient. Uh, viewers on shore, we're just sitting here with uh, just a little bit of the wreck in view. It takes a long time for these ship moves to to uh, to to reach down the 5,300 meters of cable that we have out, um, and we want to be very diligent and. and careful with with how we um how we move the ship so that we don't damage either the rov or the wreck uh so just bear with us We're, we'll we'll be exploring very soon how much further you want to be past that i think we got about five meters to go here but i can put in another movement down the line to get us away from that Mm -hmm. Nautilus, Silver Spring. Yeah, go ahead. Just so you guys know, our mics have been off for a while. So whatever that noise is, we think it's on Nautilus. We have the video team looking into it. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Jim. We, um, yeah, <laughs> no, no blame going around. <laughs> I'm talking about blame, we're just trying to localize the source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I don't plan you the rest. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Where are you thinking we're at? Just assuming we're probably somewhere. Okay. I wonder if there's a mic in the data lab that's on. It's worth checking. Mm -hmm. Ed's checking the, the various okay. feeds okay. to see if it's one of our, our call-in lines. Sounds like someone opened up a channel in the kitchen. <laughs> we have. That'd be a bad place for a mic. Mike, could you talk a little bit about um, are we planning to inspect torpedo damage from when a coggy was scuttled? Yeah, we um, we got some really good advice from John um, that uh, the four torpedoes that were fired by the four uh, different uh, destroyers, the Arashi, Higakazi, Maikazi, and Nawaki, uh, so they each fired one. They all hit the starboard side, so that's not, we're on the port side now. So um, we, we will, when we come back around the stern, we're going to be dropping down periodically to take a look for the torpedo damage. My sense, because we did look at the, the hull a little bit uh, when we first got here, my sense is that it's buried. Um, we're, it looks like the ship is buried be above the mud line. I'm sorry, above the water line in the mud. So we may not be able to see that, but we will take a look for it. Nav. I was just doing a quick radio check, make sure we uh, we do have a hot mic somewhere, maybe on the ship, um, just for awareness, that's what that background noise is. Thanks. question for our ROV team, and I think Derek, maybe you would be able to answer if this is an okay time for a question. I didn't write it down. Um, it's been about five minutes, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
So watch lead, uh, we were thinking of doing a ship move at 30 meters, uh, bearing 4-0. Right. Can we not step forward more first? Uh, it's it's working its way down, and then we got that thing right in front of us. I'd yeah. like to get okay. away from it. Yep, that works. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Bridge nav. But we'd like to do a ship move three zero meters bearing zero four zero. Thank you. So I'm curious about how we identify any potential hazards as we approach these sites. Like, is that something that can be picked up on sonar at all, or is that just based yeah. on video? Yeah, we're um, we go slow, as you can see. Yeah. Um, uh, typically, we'll see stuff. If it's a if it's a decent sized object on the scanning sonar, um, which is on on top of our uh, Atlanta, um, before we see it with the camera. Um, but if it's something like a line or a, a sm something that's uh, smaller, uh, we may not be able to see with the sonar. But uh, that, that's why you'll see um, Jake is is panning around into the deep blues every now and then, just taking a look at what's around us. I know we just talked about like identifying hazards as we approach a ship, like the whole time that we're down here exploring, but uh, can you remind us my, maybe how we, uh, kind of the steps or the process for how we explore these ships? If you, if you were wondering about uh, doing like a 360 scan first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, that's exactly right. We, um, we come down and, and I like to kind of stand off like we're doing and look in at the wreck uh, from every angle on both port and starboard and then bow and stern. We're about halfway done with that now. Um, and then we will go and, and maybe fly over the flight deck, look at the elevator shafts, um, take a look at the debris field, that sort of thing. Once we um, once we kind of have a feeling for the orientation of the site, how how buried it is, what, what hazards and snags there may be, that sort of thing. Nice, thank you. So aloha, aloha ahi ahi as the sun goes down in Papahanao Mokuakea. Um, konnichiwa to our um, friends out in Japan. We are currently in the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. An aina akua to the Kanako O'ivi or the native people of Hawaii. Um, how amazing is it that we're seeing this, the depths of the ocean um, in the realm of Kanaloa, our god of the sea. Um, just so reverent, um, just looking at, you know, many years of this wreck being um, the Akagi, the Imperial Japanese Navy um, aircraft carrier, the Akagi that's been laying on the seafloor, you know, five, over 5,000 meters. Um, on the seafloor, and we are the first to be able to, you know, be viewing this, um, you know, in real time as we live stream this to all of you around the world. And um, just wanted to remind us all about this, the sacredness of this place, of Papahanao Mokuakea. We consider it our Aina Akua, the realm where our gods and our ancestors um, are dwelling the place where life originates, and we call this place Po. And on the other side, on the main Hawaiian Islands, we consider that Ao, the land of the living, of consciousness, of living beings. And so um, having this um, Akagi and the other aircraft carriers and um, remnants of the Battle of Midway laying on the floor on the sea floor in this very sacred realm. Um, it's just very poignant. And it just um, reminds us about the sanctity of life and the way that um, we as Kanaka view this place. And so we honor all of those. We honor our uh, Japanese comrades, our American 
sailors and um, pilots and those who fought in this war, the Battle of Midway in 1942. We honor all of the lives lost and um, we reverently are, um, you know, being in this place with respect, with understanding of the value of human life and the tragic impacts of war. And so we wish all of those who may have connections, who may have had um, family members, Ohana, who were part of this battle, this three-day battle, 1942, in June of 1942. We honor their sacrifice. We honor their lives. And we honor the sacredness of Papahana Mukuhakea. So aloha to all of you, aloha ahi ahi. As the sun goes down in Papa Hanau Mokuakia. Looks like we have the second of those 120 yep. millimeter guns here. Seems like we're finally starting to swing a little bit closer. Yeah. Hopefully it won't overshoot. Yeah, it's takes about 15 minutes, I think, Yeah. at least, to feel those moves. We are joined in the back row by co-expedition leader Megan Cook. Hello. <laughs> Mostly I just changed seats. Yeah, <laughs> she's been in the, in the studio the whole time. I'm happy to sit here and be with you. Amelia, thank you so much for sharing that reflection and reminder about this place that we're at. I think it's easy to contextualize visiting a battlefield or visiting a site like this and, and remembering its reverence, but it's so important to remember that this entire seascape around us, this entire realm of Papahanaumokuakea holds that same, that same reverence and care. And it really is a, a privilege to be here, um, to enter, <laughs> we, you know, we ask permission on so many levels to be here, um, both from the permitting process, from the co-trustees, um, and the, the diligent work and dialogue that happens there as we reflect and refine you know, plans and how, how we want to, how we ask to, how we revise our plans to learn about this place, to be sure it's in line with the long-term benefit of the place and the communities to which this place is deeply connected, the Kanako EV communities. But then also from our protocol, um, another way we ask permission or um, be here. Would you share some about the protocol that has been part of the voyage? Sure, mahalo, uh, Megan. So um, cultural protocols are really important in the Hawaiian culture and in other indigenous um, societies as well but as we entered Papahanaumokuakea um, just understanding the space that we're entering that um, there is always that level of respect um, the asking you know not just entering a space as if you are owning it but you're asking to enter this space and that's a very um, Hawaiian way um, of being in the world understanding that as humans we're not you know, at the top of the food chain. We are one of the interconnected organisms that um, is required to have balance and equilibrium in the world. And so the protocols have been such an integral part of the expedition um, as we move into Papahanaumokuakea. Prior to leaving, 
um, we did a ceremony where um, our cultural liaison, Mahina Cavalieri, um, wove a beautiful laukia tea leaf lei. And that tea leaf lei was wrapped on the railing of the um, Nautilus to, to create like a, 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 a boundary, a place of protection as we journey into this sacred area. We also do oli. We um, oli our chants. And we have specific chants that we do at specific moments, whether it's by um, the deploying of the ROV into the depths of Kanaloa, the um, Hawaiian god of the sea, or when the ROV is coming up and coming back. And we just have great gratitude for the ability to explore this realm that human eyes normally do not ever see. And human beings rarely are a part of this ecosystem. And so we are always in, in great gratitude and humility in the way that we um, receive these gifts. This being able to view this live and to have this imagery of, of um, you know, the remnants of a, a tragic war um, is, is a gift that we'll, we can see, we can, we can use history to um, remember and to honor and then to move forward hopefully without having to revisit this type of, of history. And so protocols are just really important. We connect with our kupuna, with our ancestors as Kanaka O'ivi through prayer, through chant, through that frequency that we create and that um, attitude that we um, employ in our cultural protocols. So it's been, I, I think, you know, just one of those very important components of the work that we do, that we incorporate cultural protocol, Hawaiian language, um, uh, Hawaiian knowledge systems, and really weave that in with the scientific methodologies and research that's occurring in this very indigenous space called Papahanaumokuakea. So I just want to uh, put a um, gratefulness out there, you know, to the environment, to our ancestors who have been a part of this place from the beginning, from the beginning of, of um, our Hawaiian world and archipelago. And we, we mahalo them for the gifts that they give to us and the protection they provide to us as we move throughout Papahanaumokuakea. So mahalo, um, Megan. Looks like that was like... Malia, that was beautiful. And I just wanted to thank you for all of um, the reflection that you just shared right now in this moment and then everything that you shared with us uh, so far in this expedition. And I just feel so lucky and so grateful to be out here with you and learning so much from you um, while we're out here together. So just thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And you know, it's it's a collective effort in Hawaii. We call it a kako, a kako thing, because we know that we don't work in isolation. Mm -hmm that we depend on each other. Um, and so it is a collective effort of many, many Kanaka O'ivi who um, are kupuna, who, who protected this place from the beginning um, before um, you know NOAA or the US Fish and Wildlife, um, we were taking care of this place. This is our kuleana and our responsibility to malama, to, to take care of and steward. And so, um, you know, this is just part of being an indigenous person, is knowing that our lands and our oceans feed us and we are dependent on them. And so in return, we are making sure that we protect them as best we can for those who come after us. So, mahalo nui. Nautilus, Silver Spring, you are right at the area where you had those projecting masks coming out with wire. So I would not drop below this. You have a potential entanglement. OK, thanks, Jim. Wh where were those? Did we see them already? In front of it and hovering near it. Now you're going below it. Looks like it's gone. Okay. 
What was the original purpose of those structures? There were uh, retractable radio masts that oh, could, okay. um, because the um, they would swing outboard, uh, you know, during flight operations, and then would raise up, uh, you know, to get the uh, the aerial higher uh, to improve reception. Gotcha. Thanks, Russ. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I see those on the plans now. Kinda. So just to clarify, Russ, these are like retractable fold down radio masts. So when you're flying planes, you keep them low, and when you had your air group either all the way or all back, they could come up upright? Yeah, that's it exactly. We just wanted to make sure if there was any of that stuff left for any wire that uh, you were aware of. Yeah, thanks. It look, yeah, it does look like they're not there. That's the end of that shit move. All right. Um, I know that there, there's little scary things up there. Can we get a little closer? Do you think? It's just, you know, we're kind of almost outside of the pool of the light. Yeah. Uh, we can do a bearing of 35 this time. In between these mics, you're going to have those other gun tubs. Yep. Yeah, I see one of them on the left. <coughs> you want to go... Three zero. Yeah. Zero three zero. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well this one. Still, it. it'll bring us closer in. Bridge nav. Like to do a ship move three zero meters, bearing zero three zero. Correct, thank you. If anything, we can come up a little bit, look down, and then back off. Okay. If we get too close. Confirming those were radio aerials. Is was the correct was the name for those? That's correct. Thank you. I can't quite make out what you're sharing there. I think it may be Silver Spring.
So in channel three, our viewers are taking a look at uh, a sonar map. Can we have someone give us an explanation about what these colors mean or represent and what they're telling us about the site? The darker reds are stronger hits, and the lighter uh, blue uh, represent um, softer hits. And then the black is places where there's shadowing or no returns from the sonar. Mm. What's a hit mean, Jake? Uh, it means, well, basically what you're doing is you're sending out sound. Um, it's traveling outwards, reflects off of something, and then comes back. So when it reflects, it hits something. It's called sound navigation and ranging sonar. How far away can our sonar see with sound? Right now we are using 10 meter divisions. So each one of those rings is 10, 10 meters radius. So 10, 20, 50. Right now the sonar is set to 50 meter range. Uh, normally we have it set to 20 meters, but we want to get a little closer view. Mm -hmm. And what's the angle that, how wide is the sonar scanning? Or are we scanning 360? We are scanning 360 currently. This is our 360 scanning sonar. And it's mounted on top of the vehicle? It's mounted on the bottom. On it's the actually bottom. downwards looking. Oh, I lied earlier. Yep. Cool. I think Argus is on the top. Mike, in these tubs, you're going to start seeing the 25 millimeter anti-aircraft weapons. Yeah, right now we're trying to uh, just get closer to the wreck so we can see better. Understood. Below these le this level, down close to the mud line, will be the casemate gun, the 8 inch casemate gun. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, those might be buried, Jim. We'll take, we'll take a look. Yeah, it looked like the. Uh, the wreck was, was buried a lot further below the, the water line. Understood. But if we got a chance to peek, yeah. it would be awesome. Yep. Those same guns are also present on the starboard side, and I wonder if, um, you know, from what we saw on the bow, it looked like somehow the... Uh, the mud line was pushed up on, on that side, so maybe we'll get a better view on the starboard side. And I know you're planning on looking for uh, the uh, torpedo damage over there as well. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to take a look. Um, my sense is that all of that's going to be masked by the mud. It seems to be similarly soft and, uh, yeah, soft is the only word I'm going to go with there, um, uh, as it was at Yorktown. Um, but we will take a look. Roger that. Do we have any interest in trying to go uh, lower down to the seafloor here? Just image a different part of the... Yeah, well, while, we're, while we're here waiting for the ship to move, we can. Yeah, I can descend slowly. Oh, and there's the mud. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't very far at all. <laughs> you can see that, it, like, it, there's probably very, very little current here because you can still see how it's pushed up. There's no scour or uh, burial up against the side of the wreck. So it's like all those, like, um, gobs of mud that have rolled down, it's like they're, they remain where they were uh, for the last 81 years. Like, there's been no movement of anything, it seems. Mike, what I'm beginning to wonder about here, particularly what we saw at the bow and what we were seeing with this, yeah, well, okay. is this, I mean, particularly with the kind of structure we're seeing here, with like the, the, basically these larger lumps, I'm wondering when the vest, when Akagi came down, 
that it not only sort of hit bow in, but if it also slid or somehow moved to the side and plowed up some seabed, as Nevada did, as you may recall, when we saw that. Yeah, it's possible. We, there's also, uh, based on the son um, the side scan sonar from the AUV, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, like an impact crater around it, it with the debris field. It can be impact crater, but can also be down blast. Yeah, yeah. You know, it displaces the water that's moving ahead of the vessel before it lands in, um, which is what we've certainly seen with Titanic and with some of the sonar here it suggests as well. So the complexity of the site formation process is such that I would, I, I'm beginning to suspect that after the downblast hit, as a cloggy struck the seabed, it did stop moving not only forward, but was also moving yeah. the port. And that, that And that this amount of mounding that we're seeing on the port side may be indicative of that. Pull out before we get too close to those protrusions. <laughs> Coming back up. Nav, what's, are we waiting on a ship move right now? Yes. Okay, what are we doing? We're moving 30 meters uh, at 30, bearing of 3-0. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, that should put us a little closer. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've gone about mm, 13. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello to all of our viewers, we know we have new folks joining us constantly throughout, so welcome to the dive. Welcome to Nautilus Live and our live streams. We're really happy to be able to share this time with you in this reverent place um, for this uh, extremely important milestone in the history of the Battle of Midway to be able to identify and bear witness and reveal uh, the final resting place of the Imperial Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi, the largest of the uh, Japanese carriers, the largest of the aircraft carriers that fought in the Battle of Midway, um, which was severely damaged on June 4th, um, was subject to an, a massive fire in her hangar decks and on the flight deck and sank after being scuttled on June 5th. Um, this is the first time anyone has Akagi, that's why we're having trouble years since is that, that time. The uh, no. This expedition is made possible by it's so many partners and so much work that has happened over the decades, um, including uh, survey work by the Vulcan Inc. team in 2019, who is a side scan sonar, so a sideways looking sonar, a different tool than we used in our mapping surveys, uh, created an image of could this be image site. distortion too, it's hard to tell. Um, which they expected was a Kogi, but we're not able to visually confirm. So, uh, really appreciative of all of our collaborators and collaborators, everyone in the ocean exploration community, everyone in who is connected to this place in one way or another, from their family, from their stories, from the media we watch and read, from their love of the ocean, and knowing that the ocean contains all of this history. Um, to be able to add to this story. We have been on site for nine hours now on the seafloor. No, I'm sorry, 
<laughs> not right. We have been on site for about uh, six hours on the seafloor. Um, we launched, it's uh, 7.20 p.m. We launched at about 10 this morning and took many, many hours to descend down here. We're at 5,000 meters, over 17,000 feet, three and a third miles, however you like, over 2,700 fathoms. Whatever for unit you would like. Out there. Yeah, whichever <laughs> unit you like. A long, long way down in the ocean. Uh, 30. Viewers interested um, if we've seen any aircraft, any zeros. Mike, what can you tell us about that? Bridge uh, nav. No, we haven't. Um, we, we were um, discussing with some of the our. Um, 10 meter move, please, at bearing 310. We were discussing with some of our colleagues on, on the on shore. Um, and it, it appeared that there were only two zeros on the on the flight deck when the bomb struck, um, and if there had been any in the hangar deck, they probably have all melted from the the intense fires. So I, we kind of suspect that the chances of finding aircraft at this site are pretty low, uh, if not zero. Um, that's not an intentional play on words. Um, so yeah, I, I, there is a debris field. Um, from, from the sinking of the ship, probably bits of flight deck and other things that fell off on its way down through the 5,300 uh, meter water column. Uh, but I, I don't suspect that any of those are likely to be planes. The planes we know as zeros, were they the only kind of planes that were on Akagi? No, there were Hey, Russ, are you still there? Can you uh, remind me what other types of planes were on Akagi besides Zeros? Yeah, happy to, Mike. So uh, there were three main types of aircraft, you know, fighter aircraft, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers. Uh, you know, for the Japanese, it would have been the um, uh, Mitsubishi A6M, the uh, Type Zero, uh, as, the, um, as the primary, well, the only fighter uh, type uh, embarked um, uh, with the fleet. Then there was um, the uh, the Type 97, which is um, you know the uh, the Aichi uh, dive bomber, and then um, the Type 99 or the B5 uh, B5N2 um, uh, torpedo bomber uh, made by uh, Nakajima. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. So the zeros were the fighter planes, but then the uh, the other two types were the the torpedo and, and dive bombers. Got it. Russ, could you share a little bit more about your about your background? I think you know each of our scientists sure brings so much um, of a different background, and the level of detail you just shared yeah. is <laughs> remarkable. Like, can you share a bit about ARC Heritage Foundation and yourself? Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Um, so yes, I'm uh, Russ Matthews. I'm the president of uh, ARC Heritage Foundation, and it's a nonprofit, uh, you know, dedicated. Uh, you know, to the to the study and um, you know uh, investigation, documentation, um, preservation of you know the um, the relics and wrecks of our um, you know aeronautical and maritime past. Um, founded in 2016 by myself and uh, and a couple of my uh, my friends and colleagues, um, uh, you know who also share this same the same passion for for exploration and for history and. And um, and as a way of kind of connecting to that history of you know finding finding the, the traces of it that connect you know the, the past to the to the present day um, you know it kind of grew out of an effort actually um, to study and um, and hopefully in the future to preserve um, a very rare type of U.S. Navy uh, plane from World War II uh, the same type that was uh, deployed here at the Battle of Midway uh, called the uh, Douglas. Uh, TBD Devastator, um, but we've also um, done a, a number of other projects, including uh, in 2019, um, you know, conducting a search off of uh, Ponga Pongo, American Samoa, with our partners at, at OET and on uh, on Nautilus, and uh, where I had the pleasure of um, of acting as as co PI with uh, with Dr. Mike Brennan, who's on this uh, on this team as well. Um, 
searching for a, a pioneering Pan American Airways uh, flying boat that was lost um, trying to establish uh, link, aerial links between the United States and New Zealand in uh, January of 1938. Um, more recently, we've done projects um, working with the DPAA, uh, you know, searching for and documenting um, uh, aircraft wrecks um, both in um, in European waters and also in the in back in the uh, the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. So uh, this is this is this is absolutely this is you know this is Christmas. This is my birthday. <laughs> you know just to be here. You know well virtually here um, and getting to to do this and to um, to you know really work together to to write uh, the next chapter of the, the Battle of Midway. Um, it's um, it's it's really something and a, and a testament to, to to the vision that you know that, that Dr. Ballard had so many years ago to uh, you know, to use telepresence you know in order to uh, to bring this uh, to the world and to share share the experience of exploration because that is what we are doing right now. I, I, watching this, I was just remarking to myself and now to you um, how really what we're doing every second we're seeing something that people haven't seen in in 81 years um and and we're actually we're seeing sites that no eyes uh, no human eyes have ever ever seen um and that is that is the essence of of exploration to go into the unknown and to share that knowledge and bring it back to the to the world and and, and to share it you know with this, this you know miraculous uh, it really, you know, technology now, uh, where it is streaming live uh, around the world, and it's a it's a privilege to be a part of it. Yeah, thanks for that, Russ. That was awesome. Um, yeah, we're so glad that uh, you and and our other colleagues at DPAA and aircraft experts, as as well as uh, Jim and Phil and and our colleagues at uh, uh, Naval History and Heritage Command and, and everyone else our uh, archaeology friends at uh, uh, our archaeologists uh, in Japan and, and everyone else who's participating in. We have such a, a broad spectrum of, uh, of expertise on shore, which, as you say, is, is exactly what uh, Dr. Ballard's vision was, was, you know, you have a couple scientists on board, but then we have access to pretty much everybody uh, that, we, that we would need for any sort of expedition. Um, and this is really, really proving that because um, you know, you guys are pitching in as if as if you were on board. No matter what hour it is, yeah. how many coffees have been consumed today? In including standing as as long of watches as we are, if not longer. <laughs> so it's it's possible I, on the side scan image that's in the dive plan. Yeah. Um, it shows this part of the ship. It, it looks kind of deformed in. Um, so I don't know if that's why we're having trouble getting close enough. Okay. I don't know if that's actually true or if that's from the, like, um, sort of an artifact of the way the imagery gets collected um, from a moving platform, but... Yeah, it's it's strange. Um, see what yeah, I'm talking I mean, about? Yeah, I mean, I don't want you... I don't want us to move, like, too far into, like, a hole in the deck but I you know obviously we'd like to be able to see uh, as much of the ship as we can um, I do kind of oh I see what you're talking about yeah yeah in the side scan image yeah it's just kind of pushed in so yeah. it could be that's that's a real distortion of the wreck or it could be that that's how uh, the imagery was distorted from movement of like the AUV or something yeah, well, I mean, um, let's see. So we're facing, we're kind of facing, oh, we are facing, we're facing the wreck now? Jeez, okay. oh yeah, right, that's what the sonar shows. Um, I mean, I don't see anything all that scary in terms of like a hole on the sonar. It seems like it's a flat wall. Yeah, um, Yeah, I'm just I, trying to explain why maybe no, we kind of drifted away. Yeah. Um, um, we do have a 10 meter move that's trying to translate down to the vehicle, so hopefully we'll swing into that next ring there on the sonar. Yeah, can we, is it possible to move just like 10 meters forward, like at 315? That's what we, that's what's, 
That's what we just yep, did? That's what's called in okay. right now. Yeah. The ship's just about completing the move, so. All right, the RV yeah, we'll should, stand by. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, yeah, it's, uh, it just is what it is. Yeah, it's been about five minutes, but. Yeah, okay. It, it feels, it felt like uh, we were able to stay on site with Yorktown better, but I think I'm just forgetting the um, more uh, stressful parts <laughs> already. <laughs> Because I know that we, you know, it's just it's just hard to make the exact movements and have the ship and the vehicle respond as quick as we'd like them to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the update. I, that's fine. We'll just let's stand by for a few more minutes. Okay. Thanks. Analogy always falls apart a little because they need to like scale everything relative to everything else. But I often think about, you know, if we were to try and bring these scales to maybe more recognizable players, you know, that imagining moving the ROV delicately in these small distances over such yeah. an exaggerated vertical distance, you know, it's kind of like your helicopter or your drone carrying maybe like a little camera on the end of, I don't know, some dental floss, or like a string, <laughs> yeah. you know, and trying to fly this helicopter and this drone and these extremely exaggerated distances beneath it relative to, you know, the, the total size of the ship. You know, we're, we're less than 100 meters long as a ship, uh, nearly only half of that, and then we have 5,200 meters of cable beneath us spooled out down to an ROV that's only two meters long, you know, and um, trying to move that precisely and um, efficiently, you know, and quickly is a little bit off the table. You know, we're, we're here in the land of patience as we wait, but um, I think that the scale of what we're trying to do is often one of the things I find myself trying yeah. to wrap my brain around. Yeah, uh, speaking of scale, uh, Daniel uh, made a very interesting uh, point yesterday when we were uh, diving Yorktown. He said that out here in the, in the far uh, end of the, of the Hawaiian island chain uh, and the far end of the Papahanaumokuakea uh, monument, um, where the, the 48 people on the ship are, are, the, are the closest people to us, and then the next closest humans to us are the people in the inter International Space Station, which is 250 miles above us in the sky, uh, and th there's no other humans uh, close enough, closer to us than them, which is really a, a frightening scale to think of. We're uh, just that remote out here. Also, that the space station is, I think, closer than I think. <laughs> I think 250 miles is about right. Yeah. Um, here we'd have a little, you know, maybe a few people in contention, you know, the next closest groups may be um, the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Debris Project right now oh, yeah, is at Holani Ku, which they, makes them maybe in the ballpark of 150 miles from us, but still very far. Yeah, and, and I think Midway Island too is closer than Mid that, right? Midway is farther than that. Where, oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, Holani Ku is west of Kauai Halani, oh, okay. and we are west and northwest of Halani Ku. So, um, you know, that that would probably put our friends at, at Kauai Halani at Midway. Um, often bird research teams from Fish and Wildlife, sometimes monk seal research teams there. Um, but that, w that would be our podium yeah. team. So another ship, a few, some bird and seal researchers, and the space station. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sitting here just trying to like take all of that in. Like, yeah. I've like looked yeah. at maps and like uh, tried to understand that. It's just like so incredible to think about. And earlier when y'all were describing uh, the cable, I'm curious, do we switch out the cable that Adelina is connected to like in between expeditions or seasons or like how long does that cable like last? As long as we hope it will last for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, that cable, and needed to be replaced, a new cable came onto Nautilus um, a few years ago. 
At the same time as we did some other major work to the ship, we stretched the ship. We actually lengthened the ship by four meters, added, um, and in that process also reconfigured the winch. The winch used to sit out on the deck almost like a spool of thread, like just one Ooh. drum that had the cable spool off of it. We got a much larger winch, a different style. A much more complicated winch. <laughs> yes, definitely, <laughs> called a traction winch that still has that large spool of thread storage drum, but also a whole set of different pulleys and cables. So it, um, you know, I think just with our thread analogy, you could imagine like pulling very hard on a piece of thread and having it snap off, mm -hmm. off of, you know, that's how I would take thread off of a spool. And so instead by running it through all these other pulleys, um, you can distribute that tension and not get the, those like sharp pulls. But the footprint of that um, winch was much, much larger than the direct drive winch. So it needed to reconfigure things. It went below the deck, so you now can't see it. You have to climb down a ladder to it. Um, and we got a new cable at that point. And although we don't currently have a remotely operated vehicle that could dive to 7,000 meters or 7,500 meters, we have that much cable. There's that much on it? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> on it, so uh, uh, more than we would need. Uh, but yeah, these, the cable is, um, a cable like that is in the ballpark of a, a quarter million dollars or so, um, maybe more installed. So certainly we, it's part of, um, reviewers or everybody on the team has certainly watched as we've been monitoring the tension on the cable mm -hmm. and you know being really thoughtful about how we stay within the safe working load that's the safety of people is always a top concern and the safety of equipment mm -hmm. secondary to that which sometimes are one and the same often often yes. one of the same mm -hmm. yeah um, I remember back in the early days uh, we had so much trouble with cables on, on that other winch and sometimes we, like we'd get a a, a break in one and we'd have to like stream it out and then like cut part of it off to see if mm -hmm. that solved it and re-terminate it and then try it again uh, and we ended yeah. we went from like a 5,000 meter cable to like a 3,500 meter cable because we kept cutting it mm -hmm. and we got a new one and uh, yeah. yeah this one has been this one is great it's like uh, it's longer it's it's we it would always have to like readjust the winch because it wasn't like uh, spooling correctly so we have to go out there and, and like tweak it um, so that the, 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 the thing that was spooling it was, was in line. So this one has been just like, yep, just doing its thing. Mm -hmm. And these are the deepest dive. This is the deepest this dive, is the deepest dive. RV Atlanta yeah. has ever done. So we're yeah. seeing, we're seeing more wrap, more layers of the cable wrap yeah, we've than we've never, ever seen before. We've never seen this part of the cable before. Except when it was spooled on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. I'm also curious now about the uh, tether that connects Atalanta to Hercules. Where is that stored at? Like, is that just on Hercules right now? Or? Yeah, Jake, maybe that's a question for you. Did, where yeah, where'd you where put is it? <laughs> the tether right now? Jake? You got a question, Jake. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, I was. we were just talking about uh, the cable that's connected to Atalanta, and I'm curious about the tether that connects Atalanta to Hercules, where is it at? Like, is it just always connected to Hercules or is it also spooled out on a winch? Mm, it's on the back deck of the ship. <laughs> we don't use a winch for it. It's mm -hmm. uh, just free floating in the water. We connect two um, weights and two footballs, which are floats um, that provide some buoyancy to the tether. So drops off the back of Atalanta and sinks with the two weights and then also comes back up again with the two floats mm. and forms an S shape between the two vehicles uh, when, it, when they're in the water. Yeah. I think it's longer than it used to be. It's 30 meters currently and yes, for certain operations we'll go to a 50, me 50 yeah. meter tether. Um, 15? 50. Yeah. 50. Oh, really? Yeah. Hydrothermal vent towers. You don't Jeez. want to be near them. And then depending on whether we have to cut it back mm. during the season, it can get shorter. <laughs> yeah. Notch, silver spring. Yeah, go ahead. Notch, silver spring. Yeah, go ahead. Structure and site. Structure and site. We're assessing this rectangular looking box like structure, wondering if it could be the base for one of the support pillars for the flight deck in this aft area. How close? Yeah. Um, Coming up on 10 meters. Just taking a look real quick.
Yeah, one, one of the things we're thinking about is yeah. socket. I'm sorry, we didn't catch that. One more time. What we're assessing is if we were at the stern now, there was, of course, elevated flight deck in this area supported by pillars as we had at the bow, more of that type of structure aft than forward. Yeah, Jim, I'm not sure, Jim, we've got about 40 meters uh, of ship left according to the sonar. Uh, so I'm not sure, our scanning sonar, so I'm not sure we're quite at the bow yet, but we are the stern yet, but we could be. Uh, we could we could be seeing d uh, debris from those uh, supports. But, but I wouldn't quite think we're there yet. No, I, I don't think we're at the stern. I think we're getting, we're approaching. Yeah, there's a forward note for forward. Yeah, so Tori, the, the tether between the two vehicles, um, we have, we, we pre-make and pre-cut several lengths of those. And so um, because it's flexible, because it's not armored in the same way the 6-8 cable is, it's more likely to get, um, to get damaged just, or, you know, have, uh, if you, t you know, bend it really sharply, the fiber optics can, can break inside. So it takes time. So always, you know, not something we want to do all the time, but um, we do have multiple spares of those. They could be changed during an expedition if needed, or, or like Jake said, you know, um, earlier this year when we went and did an expedition with Ocean Networks Canada, we put a 50 meter tether on in between the two vehicles just to provide more safety, more buffer to stand off from hazardous tall, you know, as big as an office building towers on the seabed. Um, but. Uh, if we were diving with two vehicles here, you know, we'd want to have a shorter tether on, for example, so we could be closer, you know, because we'd want to be right up, right up to the action. So, just to finish okay. that question. Yeah, let's come up. Thank you for that. That was answered a lot for me, and now kind of has me understanding a little bit more just how we are able to see what we're seeing right now, and just kind of how special it is that we're looking at this and that we have so many people viewing just alongside of us. And also wanted to acknowledge, um, you know, here we are uh, near Kuai Helani, um, which is um, contemporarily known as uh, Midway. But this um, island was created by the same hotspot that is currently erupting over on Hawaii Island. So um, Hale Ma'u Ma'u Crater, um, in like Kilauea is currently erupting. Uh, started about three o'clock this afternoon, mm -hmm. and it just kind of shows the continuity of this um, creation of these Hawaiian islands and the archipelago. So we're at the oldest end of the islands in Papahanaumokuakea, and we have creation of new islands, um, creation of new land. Um, over on the youngest island, um, Hawaii Island. So just a beautiful kind of span of the, the beginning of islands and the end of islands is where we're at currently. So the islands have subsided, um, coral atolls have grown around them, and it's just a beautiful um, kind of process of atoll formation and one of the most spectacular kind of uh, geological processes in the world. So, so grateful to be here in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Thank you for elevating that, that continuity. Just incredible. It feels like powerful things are just happening all around. Yep. I think that's a stern uh, back we there. We did have the, Nautilus did have the pleasure in the 2019 like season, yeah, I believe, in that eruption. Mm -hmm. I think it may be we were impacted filming, in the back one we like were, that. Um, sorry, mapping like our way back from Canada to Hawaii as the eruption was going off and the lava was pouring into the ocean. And so we were able to map the ship, um, take take a mapping line with the ship near the coast. And because of the reach of the multi-beam and it going out at a sharp angle, 
were able to map some of that very freshest extension to the island as it came down. And um, I was not on board, but I think, you know, the question of can we see the eruption, that was I think, the only time the team has not been able to see lava. Incredible. Mm -hmm. not Thanks for sharing. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Do you see the casemate gun? Oh, yeah. Can you guys go down a little, angle down a little bit? Angling down. There it is, right there. Yep, there it is. Sorry, we're still starting, and you know what? I think it's one Florida. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, guys. We just didn't want we didn't want to lose this. Yeah, there's two. Of them. Yeah, there it is. There's two of them, and they're both pointed forward. So there's less mud. You see, they're right at the mud yeah, level. Yes, so that's the Yeah. That's an important observation. Can someone share with us like what those are and the importance? These are important because this is. Of, this harkens back to the beginnings of this vessel as a cruiser. This, this, these casemate guns were installed in ships pre-aircraft carrier era and before this vessel was converted. Uh, you find these on cruisers, you find these on battleships, and as you can see, a casemate weapon, they have it's these uh, higher up, we would call them air castles, but these barrels stick out and this is for ship to ship fighting. This is this is not anti aircraft. This goes back to with ships plugged it out with each other gun to gun, as opposed to anti aircraft weapons to protect you from aerial attack. So again, a reminder that we're looking at a vessel designed for one purpose and then converted to another and a reflection with that on how war at sea changed dramatically uh, and that with this vessel in particular as the flagship demonstrated that point powerfully on the 7th of December 1941 when aircraft from this carrier attacked Pearl Harbor. So seeing this, you know, it, we thought we might not see them at all because when we looked elsewhere where these guns were said to be, they were buried in the mud. So, thank you. Yeah, well, actually, actually, Jim, we hadn't been to an area where they were yet because we came down on the uh, about the midships on the other side. So this is the first ones that we could have seen. So, yeah, good eye. Do you, uh, does when, it, we, does when, it, when we looked at the mud area, that was where we had other case made guns. But all good. This, where? this is great. This is right here. And, awesome. And you can get really a feeling for the experience of being encased as part of a gun crew with a weapon like this. I mean, they are truly relics um, and just imagining the sound and the feeling Shit, as yeah, a round yeah. from this weapon would be discharged. It's just that's probably what we were saying wild today. to see. Yeah. I think that's probably what, where we are. Yeah, so we're also and these weapons in this particular arrangement are unique to Akagi and the, thus uh, diagnostic, once again, of this wreck, uh, being, you know, identifying it as the flagship of Kitukutai. Yeah, certainly a good reminder that this, uh, obviously so much of our story is connected to the Battle of Midway here, but, you know, for over 20 years, yeah. this ship had... <laughs> had a career, had a, many different uh, engagements it was involved in, you know, and carried